Super Crooks, written by Mark Miller and art by Lionel Yu. All right. Over the next few weeks on my channel here, I'm going to be covering various comics by Mark Miller. Miller, he has his own publishing line with his own creator-owned books, and he has so many different books, and they're all so different and so unique, and they're all usually pretty fun and entertaining, so I'm looking forward to going through some of these. Now, I've covered some of Miller's other work on my channel. You can look up on my video on Wanted, as well as on Jupiter's Legacy, and pretty much all of Miller's stuff is going to be adapted on Netflix in some capacity, whether it be a TV show or a movie. Now, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down the comic series Super Crooks, which Netflix is actually going to be adapting into a Japanese anime, which I guess they'll translate or something. But uh, that's interesting. And not only that, they're apparently also going to do a live action adaptation. Now, Remember how Netflix had this Jupiter's Legacy TV show, which they canceled after just one season? Well, supposedly, Super Crooks is in the same universe as Jupiter's Legacy, so they're trying to say, like, oh, Super Crooks is actually continuing Jupiter's Legacy in a way. Anyway, we'll see. When you read the comic, it does not seem like it's in the same world as Jupiter's Legacy, but it could be. It's about superheroes and whatnot, right? Now, the concept for this book is pretty fun. Basically, Mark Miller watched the fantastic Ocean's Eleven movie with George Clooney, Brad Pitt, and Matt Damon, and others, where they rob a whole bunch of stuff in a very cool way. He took that concept, and he smashed it together with superheroes and supervillains. So this book is essentially an Ocean's Eleven-style heist, except done with these powered supervillains, and I gotta say, it is quite fun and enjoyable, and I think you will all dig it. So let's dive into the story for Super Crooks by Mark Miller. Issue 1 In New York City, supervillain Johnny Bolt has electric powers. He just pulled off a heist with a man named Frostbite and Frostbite's brothers. The superhero, known as the Gladiator, though, is on his trail. Johnny Bolt, he is running away with his crew. He gets on to the subways of New York. The subway train pulls away. The hero, Gladiator, he is in pursuit, though, and he jumps onto the moving subway train right through the window. Gladiator pushes his way through the civilians, punches, and takes down the rest of Johnny's crew. Johnny, he is cornered now by Gladiator, and he tells him, though, to get back, I've got electric powers. And Gladiator responds, do I look like I give a shit? And he punches Johnny Bolt in the face, taking him down and arresting him. Johnny Bolt is taken back to the Supermax prison, which Johnny often finds himself winding up at. The thought gets put into his head while he is in this prison once again, that there are like 200 superheroes in the tri-state area? Why would he even be attempting a heist in New York when he can try to do heists in other parts of the world? Five years later in Las Vegas at the Osiris Casino, we see another villain named Carmine, aka The Heat. Carmine does not have much in the way of powers, but he does have a trademark ray gun, which he is famous for using. Carmine the Heat, he's an old man, and he is gambling at a roulette table, and he is winning a lot, perhaps too much. He has won nine games in a row, and he is betting on single numbers, which if you know roulette, your chances of winning when you're betting on just a single number coming up is pretty slim. He walked in with about 50 bucks, and now he is currently up 400 grand. In the casino security room, they are monitoring him, and they are watching this Carmine winning over and over again. They don't know how he is doing it, though. And on the security monitors, they watch Carmine win again, and now Carmine is up 12 million dollars. 
Carmine's trick is that in the casino parking lot, he is working with an accomplice, a super-powered young man named Walt Flanagan. Walt is communicating with Carmine. Walt Flanagan's power is that he can see 30 seconds into the future, and he was feeding Carmine the winning numbers. Walt, though, is getting nervous. Carmine is getting too greedy. They might catch on to them. Walt doesn't want to give Carmine any more winning numbers. The people running the casino, though, they manage to figure out what's going on. And they grab Walt Flanagan from his car in the parking lot and bring him inside. After a while, the casino boss, named the Salamander, has both Walt Flanagan and Carmine brought into his office. The Salamander is a ruthless businessman, a supervillain with his own crew, and the owner of the Osiris Casino that Carmine and Walt were cheating in. The Salamander will not accept cheating in his casino. The Salamander, he kills Walt Flanagan right there in the room. And then he turns to Carmine and tells him, Listen up, you old prick. You came here to dip our pockets to the tune of 12 million bucks? I respect that. It shows balls. But to make amends, you need to pay us back a hundred million bucks. And we want that money exactly one month from today. We need to use you as an example to all the other little pricks out there who think they can walk in here and take us for a ride. It's nothing personal. Just a matter of protecting our super criminal reputations. Carmine pleads. How is he going to get a hundred million in one month? The salamander doesn't care. He says, rob a bank. Now get out of here and get work to bringing him his money. So, if someone steals 12 million from you and you catch them, I guess their punishment is either death or pay me a hundred million dollars? I don't know if that's fair or realistic, but this is the situation Carmine finds himself in. Elsewhere, it has been five years since Johnny Bolt got arrested and tossed into the Supermax prison. Well, he has finally been let out. Johnny, he visits his old flame and former fiance, a woman named Casey. Casey is a very powerful psychic. She can utilize telekinesis and induce powerful illusions. She is working as a lowly waitress right now. She has gone straight. And she is angry with Johnny because the two of them had plans. They were saving up a retirement fund and they were going to quit their life of crime. But on the day of their wedding, Johnny pulled off a jewelry heist and got himself arrested. And that is how he wound up in jail for the last five years. Casey asks Johnny how he could just throw away their life like that. Johnny answers that honestly, he didn't think the two of them had enough money to retire on. So he pulled a job and it just so happened to not work out. Now the two of them kind of have nothing. As the two of them are in this restaurant talking, where Casey works at, a car speeds up to the establishment and it parks and stops. Carmine, who is old friends with both of them, he gets out of the car and Johnny and Casey run out to meet him. Carmine looks very beat up and panicked. Carmine owes a hundred million to the Salamander, the casino boss. He tells both Casey and Johnny, I really need your help. The two of them take Carmine back to Casey's apartment, and they put Carmine to bed for the night. On the TV, we learn about another superhero in the world named the Praetorian. He is a superhero, but a very corrupt superhero. He was on trial for 57 accounts of abusing his authority. The judge, though, showed him leniency because of all the occasions that he saved the world. So he was let go without any charges, and the Praetorian walked free. Johnny and Casey, as previous villains, they know the Praetorian personally, 
and know that he is a big piece of shit. Casey and Johnny can't believe that he got off scot-free. Casey reminisces about a time the Praetorian arrested her, but told her that he would let her go if she gave him a blowjob. The Praetorian, he is a very powerful hero. He is reported to have 27 different powers, including, but not limited to, self-multiplication, he can clone himself to attack others, teleportation, laser vision, laser beams shot from his hands, lightning manipulation, etc. Johnny and Casey, they talk, and they want to help their friend Carmine pay off his $100 million debt. And Johnny, he says he has a foolproof plan. He tells Casey, why do we always work in the same areas? Why do we always try to rob areas teeming with superheroes? Why don't we try something different? Why don't we go abroad for a change? Let's find a country that doesn't have heroes and pull the biggest job of our careers. Casey asks, well, where's that? And Johnny answers, how about Spain? Think about it. Their money's just as good as anyone else's. And I've never heard of a Captain Spain, have you? We get the right guys together and this could be like taking candy from a baby, honey. Casey is skeptical, but she is willing to go along with Johnny's plan. Johnny says he needs to make a few phone calls first, but he thinks it's time to get the old gang back together. All right, issue one is done. The setup for the Ocean's Eleven superpowered heist has been established, and now it is time to meet the rest of Johnny's Super Crooks crew that he is going to put together. Before I do that, though, let's recap all the characters we've been introduced to so far. So there is Johnny Bolt with his electric powers, his former fiance Casey with psychic powers. There is Carmine, who uses a ray gun and who tried to rob the casino and it now owes the casino boss, the Salamander, a hundred million dollars. There is the hero named the Gladiator that arrested Johnny five years ago. And there was also another corrupt hero named the Praetorian. Issue 2, How Far Can a Hero Fall? Now the rest of the team. Johnny and Carmine first recruit a man named Josh, a.k.a. The Ghost. The Ghost has the ability to phase through solid matter, be it solid ground, concrete, etc. He became renowned as the world's greatest cat burglar for this ability. He led a successful career as a criminal until the presence of superheroes made life as a criminal untenable. The ghost is skeptical of Johnny Bolt's plan. He doesn't really want to return to his life of crime. But Johnny reminds him about how much the ghost owes this Carmine. When the ghost was in prison, Carmine took care of him and protected him and took him under his wing. And now Carmine needs his help. Carmine himself adds, I wouldn't ask for your help if I wasn't in a jam, kid. The ghost, he agrees to help his former mentor. The next recruit for the team is TK McCabe, sometimes called the Telekinetic. He can lift objects with his mind, and the circular symbol on his shirt glows whenever he uses his power. Right now, TK McCabe is just working a simple construction job, trying to make ends meet for his wife and children. He is not really liking his life right now, though. When he uses his powers to speed things along at the construction site job he's working, you know, using the powers to stack some items, his boss tells him to stop it. He knows he's not allowed to use his powers. The boss tells TK to put everything back that he moved with his powers back to where it started and move it properly by hand. When Johnny shows up offering TK a change of scenery, TK agrees and quits his construction job on the spot. Next recruit is an African-American man named Forecast. Forecast can control the weather. When Johnny tells Forecast that he can make some real money, Forecast is down. 
Next recruits are the super-powered brothers, known as Roddy Diesel and Sammy Diesel. Both of them are indestructible. They are able to rapidly regenerate lost limbs and heal any degree of physical damage. Carmine describes the two as the toughest sons of bitches he maybe ever worked with. Roddy and Sammy used to make a living pulling off crimes, but after repeatedly being captured by superheroes that outnumbered supervillains fivefold, Roddy and Sammy they went into an underground fighting league to compete against other supervillains to make their money. Although they repeatedly won against their adversaries, they rarely made minimum wage, as most everyone refused to fight them because of their healing factor, which most of their opponents felt gave them an unfair advantage. Johnny Bolt and Carmine come to watch them compete in this underground fighting ring against some other supervillains. One of their opponents has robotic arms, and another one has some power gloves. The match begins. Roddy, he quickly had his arm sliced off, but he regrew it. Sammy, he was incapacitated by a laser to his groin. So his brother Roddy ripped Sammy's leg off his body, and then beat the opponents into submission with that leg, and won the match. Eventually, Sammy's body regrew, and his leg and testicles came back. Roddy and Sammy they are in as well on this heist plan of Johnny Bolts. So, the heist is progressing. Johnny and his crew all fly to Spain, to the island of Tenerife, which is away from mainland Spain and part of the Canary Islands. We see all of them arrive at the airport. And just to recap everyone we have here, there is Forecast, who has weather powers, Sammy Diesel and Roddy Diesel, they have healing powers. Casey with psychic powers. Johnny Bolt with electric powers, and he's also the master planner. TK McCabe with his telekinetic powers. The Ghost with his phasing powers. And Carmine the Heat, who has a ray gun. And he is also the elder statesman of the group. Now, there is a superhero ban here in Spain. So Casey is keeping a psychic cloak all around them and makes it look like they are all rabbis here for some sort of conference to everyone here in the airport. So the security cameras, the security people, whenever they look at them, all they see is a whole bunch of rabbis. Johnny and his crew, they then leave the airport and arrive at an apartment that they will be staying at for the time being. They all settle in. We see the Diesel brothers are admiring their winnings from their last underground fight. For winning the fight, they got to keep something from their opponent. Roddy took his opponent's power gloves, while Sammy took their other opponent's robotic arms. Both of them can't wait to try these things out. There is just one more guy that Johnny wants to recruit to help them with their heist. And this guy is already in the country. Johnny goes to meet this person. The person that Johnny is meeting is a man named Glenda. Johnny was apparently talking to this Glenda on some sort of gay dating website and he was catfishing him. And Johnny planned some sort of date or hookup with this guy. But it turns out that this Glenda is not actually just a normal person. He is actually the superhero named Gladiator, whom we saw in issue 1. The very Gladiator that arrested Johnny Bolt and sent him to prison for 5 years. Johnny tells Gladiator he knows all about him being a closeted homosexual. He found out about it from one of Gladiator's former lovers that Johnny met in prison. Gladiator apparently regularly meets guys online and hooks up with them in exotic locations around the world. Gladiator, while he was talking to Johnny on this website, even sent him some sort of dirty pictures of himself to Johnny. So Johnny is blackmailing this Gladiator and says he will go public with all the pictures and info unless this Gladiator agrees to help them out with their little robbery that Johnny has planned. Gladiator, he doesn't care. He says he will not be complicit 
in any crime that this Johnny is doing. Johnny Bolt taunts him though, imitating the reaction of Gladiator's daughter if the pictures ever got out. Johnny says, Mommy, why are there pictures of Daddy's pee-pee on the news? Gladiator calls Johnny a piece of shit. He's really angry with him. Johnny replies and tells Gladiator to relax. They're not going to be robbing banks or old Spanish grandmothers. They are here in Spain to rob. And just at that moment, the disgraced hero known as the Praetorian, whom we saw on the news last issue, he storms out of a nearby restaurant where Johnny and this Glenda are meeting. The Praetorian walks over to a limo that is parked nearby. But there are some guys leaning on the limo. Praetorian, he beats the shit out of all of these guys, clearing them from the area. Gladiator asks Johnny, are you robbing the Praetorian? And Johnny says, no. He's just the bodyguard of the guy we're robbing. We're robbing him. And Johnny points over to this other guy that just leaves the restaurant right now. Out of the restaurant walks an old man with white hair. This man is apparently the greatest supervillain that ever lived. And he is currently the fourth richest man on the planet. His name is Christopher Matz. But he is better known by his nickname, the Bastard. The Bastard walks up to his limo and Praetorian, who used to be a hero and is now disgraced, is working as this Bastard's bodyguard. The Praetorian opens the limo door for the Bastard and the Bastard steps in. The Bastard is now retired from his life of crime, but he lives like a king in this country, up there in his estate in the mountains of Spain. Issue 3, The Con is On Back at the apartment that Johnny and the rest of the super crooks are renting, Johnny is talking with the rest of his crew, and Gladiator has returned with him to hear more of this plan. The rest of Johnny's crew have now all learned that they are actually here in Spain to rob the bastard, and they can't believe that this was Johnny's foolproof plan? They thought they were here in the country to pull an easy job. That was the whole reason to come to Spain and leave America to avoid the rest of the superheroes that always foil their schemes. Now they are here in Spain to rob the greatest supervillain of all time and he is protected by the Praetorian, one of the most powerful yet corrupt superheroes alive today. Johnny tells everyone to relax. Sure, the bastard was huge back in the day, but he's been retired for like 15 years. They share with Johnny a story about the bastard and his legend about how ruthless he can be. There was a guy named Danny Dubrovny. Danny, he was a criminal and he talked to the bastard and managed to convince the bastard to give him $5 million as part of some sort of real estate investment thing. But then when Danny got the money, he just took off with it and disappeared. Years went by, but then the bastard slowly started getting his revenge. He didn't kill Danny, he just killed almost every person that Danny knew. First he killed Danny's old school friend, then his favorite hooker, then his drug dealer, then his best friend, then his mother, his half-brother. Danny's current girlfriend was also killed. In total, 241 people were killed by the time the bastard confronted Danny himself. 241 people that knew Danny, dead now. So Danny, he was scared when the bastard finally confronted him in person. But he was frustrated as well. Danny pleaded with the bastard, you piece of shit, just kill me, just kill me. But the bastard, smoking a cigar, replied, I wouldn't give you the satisfaction. After that little history lesson, the rest of Johnny's crew asks Johnny, And this is the guy you want us to rob? And Johnny answers, Do you know how much money he's sitting on up there in his house? His retirement fund was like 800 million. 
we'd pay back Carmine's debt and be rich ourselves for the rest of our lives if we pull off this heist. Another crew member asks Johnny, how will they deal with the Praetorian? He's the bastard's bodyguard now. And Johnny answers, well, that's where the gladiator here comes in. Gladiator, he is still not sure he wants to be part of this whole scheme. Johnny, trying to convince him, says, Ah, oh, come on. I'd never ask one of our country's greatest heroes to participate in an actual robbery, but taking down a disgraced superhero? Somebody you kicked off your team for 300 counts of criminal misbehavior? Gladiator. He still hates Johnny and the fact that he is being blackmailed, but he agrees to help. He does not like the Praetorian and he will not be sad if the greatest supervillain that ever lived loses a whole bunch of his money. So step one of this heist is to first scope out the bastard's mansion. Casey and Roddy Diesel show up to the bastard's mansion under aliases. They are here to pitch the bastard on an investment opportunity. The bastard does take business meetings every so often to find ways to diversify and invest his money. Casey, she is using the alias of a Dr. Morgenstern, and Roddy, he is there as a Professor Reichenbach, and they are going to pitch the bastard on a four-dimensional transportation system. The man at the mansion gate named Miguel, he is skeptical of their story especially of Roddy, who is very big and muscular and imposing looking. Miguel asks him, and you're a professor of temporal physics? And Roddy answers, top of my class at Princeton, buddy. Don't be off put by my muscular frame and intimidating eye contact. I'm actually a frickin' brain box. Miguel, he lets them into the mansion gates. Praetorian, he is there, and he scans them with some of his abilities. He can sense if they have weapons or something on them, but he says that they're clean, and they have 20 minutes to make their pitch. So Casey and Roddy are walked into the bastard's study, where they meet the bastard himself in person. They pitch the bastard on their four-dimensional transportation system, which is essentially sort of like a time machine and they ask the bastard for a hundred million dollar investment up front, and then two billion spread out over ten years. The bastard is intrigued. You know, with a time machine he can do all sorts of things. But he says he is already rich and powerful. What would their machine give him that he doesn't already have? More wealth? More power? No, no. He is retired from his old career because he lost the hunger for it. Now his pleasures are drawn from the finer things in life, like his art. He shows them his Mondrian painting. The bastard pointing to the painting explains, Did you know that this lost piece is considered so beautiful, so perfect, that its lines are impossible for even the greatest forger to replicate? Art thrills me more than living outside the law. I have nothing left to prove to the super criminal fraternity. Casey and Roddy attempt to sway the bastard some more, but he refuses and they eventually have to leave. As Casey leaves, she sees an abandoned amusement park across the street from the bastard's mansion. The amusement park is called Banana Land. The bastard is apparently having it demolished in just a few weeks. The amusement park seems unimportant right now, but it will play into the story in the final issue. Casey and Roddy return back to their headquarters with the rest of the crew. Casey's psychic ability is so good, she was able to make blueprints of the entire mansion constructed from the memories of the bastard security staff. Now the thing that they are trying to steal from the bastard is something called a space case. Outside, a space case is no bigger than a briefcase, but the interiors are so enormous, you could fit an entire house inside. The bastard has one of these space cases in his basement, 
secure behind all sorts of security features. Well, all the prep work is now done. Now the actual heist is ready to commence. Johnny, he pulls out some uniforms for his crew. They are all supervillains after all. They need to dress the part. They all toast and they get ready to pull off a heist. Later on outside of their apartment, Casey says goodbye to Johnny. Her part in the heist is done. She is going to now return home and catch the first flight back to America in the morning. Johnny and Casey say their goodbyes. Johnny tells Casey, last gig, sweetheart, I promise. The next morning, Johnny and his crew are in their uniforms and are driving in an RV on their way to the bastard's mansion. The ghost, he phases through the RV flooring and then into the ground, and then he pops up down underground in the basement of the bastard's base and he shoots some security guards with tranquilizers or something that puts them all to sleep. On the surface, in the RV, Johnny and his crew arrive at the mansion gates. Johnny tells his crew, no fatalities, okay? We are not here to kill anyone. Forecast, he uses his weather powers and electrocutes some of the guards on the perimeter of the mansion, knocking them out. And then Johnny and the whole crew storm the mansion. Meanwhile, over at the airport, Casey, who was getting on a flight home, is stopped by the Praetorian. She apparently forgot to use her psychic block trick powers that would shield her from the cameras at the airport that scan to try and detect superpower people. And the Praetorian, he puts his hand on her shoulder and tells her, what's up, baby? You leave in such a hurry, you forgot your little trick? The scanners got you 40 minutes ago, you frickin' idiot. Move a muscle and I'll fry you to the floor. The bastard, he walks into the airport as well. And he confronts Casey and says, Oh, my dear sweet thing, don't ever mistake me for stupid. Issue 4, The Big Finale Inside the Bastard's Mansion, the heist continues. Forecast distracts some guards by making it snow indoors. While the guards are distracted, some of the super crooks toss the guards around and knock them out. Forecast, he then chills the hinges of a large security door. While Sammy Diesel uses the robotic arms he won in that underground prize fighting match, to rip the security door from the wall. They then find a long shaft that leads into the depths of the mansion. So TK McCabe uses his telekinesis powers to levitate everyone safely down to the bottom of this shaft. While all this is going on, Praetorian, the bastard, and his servant, Miguel, are en route to the mansion with Casey. Back in the mansion, Johnny and crew continue making their way to their prize in the basement. They take down some more guards, and they approach an entrapped passage leading up to a vault. This passage, though, this hallway, is guarded by something called a molecular chainsaw, which is basically a whole bunch of lasers that'll slice you apart if you walk down this path. Even the ghost who can phase would get sliced up here as well. So in order to get past this part, it's kind of humorous. They send Roddy and Sammy Diesel who can regenerate their body and not die. So they send the two of them through and the two of them, they just continually keep getting killed and their body obliterated by these lasers over and over again and their limbs are flying off but they keep coming back to life and regrowing their body parts. And slowly, a little bit further, one bit at a time, they keep coming back to life, crawling a little bit further, dying again, coming back to life and crawling a little bit further. After 13 long minutes of this, they finally make their way to the other side of this hallway and manage to turn off the security switch that deactivates the lasers or the molecular chainsaws, as they are called. 
and the others can safely walk across. We see all the many severed limbs of Roddy and Sammy Diesel left behind. Honestly, this is probably my favorite part of the book, this crazy way they got across this hallway. Carmine the Heat, he uses his signature ray gun to melt through the vault door. And finally, the Super Crooks are face to face with the space case. And they take a peek inside the case and they see all of the bastard's money, all of his jewels, everything, and they steal it. They grab the space case and begin to depart. They will all be incredibly rich if they can get out of here with it. Elsewhere on the upper floors of the bastard's mansion, Casey is being interrogated by Miguel the Bastard and the Praetorian. They have injected Casey with some sort of truth serum. It will take a little bit to kick in though. They want to know what Casey was doing here in this country. And she gloats to them. Are you serious? You really haven't figured this out? We came here to rob your ass, man. The boys are downstairs taking you for everything. Hearing that, the Praetorian teleports downstairs and confronts them. He sees the super crooks there and the Praetorian calls them idiots. This is why Johnny Bolt wanted this gladiator to accompany them. He wanted Gladiator to fight the Praetorian if the time came. Well, the time is now. Gladiator, though, he just decides to stand back for now. Johnny blackmailed, outing him after all. So he just watches for a bit. And Praetorian, he starts beating the shit out of Johnny and the others for a while. Praetorian is just destroying them, lasering them, punching them, etc. Finally, Gladiator, he finishes smoking his cigarette and then announces to the Praetorian, Okay, punk, that's enough. You've had your fun. I didn't think you could sink any lower than the shit you pulled back on our old team. But a bodyguard for a supervillain? That's low. Even for you. Praetorian replies, What the hell? Are you trying to commit suicide? Who are you to stand there and judge me? Gladiator removes his mask and says, I'm a superhero asshole, what the hell are you? So Gladiator, he is in some sort of pink uniform, not his typical Gladiator superhero outfit. So the Praetorian did not know that he was talking to Gladiator when he said what he just said. Once Praetorian sees it as Gladiator, he starts apologizing, he says, Gladiator, uh, I'm so sorry, if i known it was you, I would never have... Gladiator calls Praetorian a disgrace to the uniform. Gladiator punches Praetorian so hard that Praetorian flies through the wall of the building. Praetorian's head basically looks like it's been decapitated. Johnny tells Gladiator, hey man, we never kill, that's the golden rule, what were you thinking? Gladiator answers, take it easy, he's still alive. All I did was a little brain damage to the piece of shit. Johnny, he's okay with that. He says, cool. They grab the space case and run. I guess Praetorian can live through his head being decapitated. <laughs> but he'll have brain damage. Upstairs in the mansion, the bastard is talking to Casey. He has figured out that she is psychic. And he tells Casey that her and her boyfriend will not get away with his money. He is not a man to be trifled with. He starts countering Casey's psychic powers with his own powers, and the bastard then explodes Casey's brain, killing her. She appears dead. The bastard then communicates through radio to the rest of his security staff, and one of the security staff radios back to the bastard and says, Sir, they've smashed up your bodyguard and leveled the entire mansion. Everything has been destroyed. You have to come back. The bastard is confused. What the hell is this guy talking about? He's standing in his mansion right now. He's even staring at his favorite painting, the Mondrian. The one painting that's lines are so perfect, so beautiful, that it is impossible for even the greatest forger to replicate. As the bastard is staring at his painting though, he notices that the lines are not perfect. 
The bastard begins panicking and says, This isn't my painting. The brush strokes are all wrong. What the hell is going on here? The bastard turns around and sees that the dead body of Casey is actually the dead body of the bastard's servant, Miguel. The bastard killed him himself. This whole thing was a psychic manipulation by Casey. The illusion then collapses around the bastard, and he finds himself standing in the nearby theme park, a little bit away from his apparently now destroyed mansion. The bastard is furious. He yells, she took us up the wrong road. This entire thing was a psychic construct. So when the bastard and the Praetorian went to the airport to pick up Casey, and they were driving her back to the mansion, Casey used her psychic powers to make them drive to the theme park, but think that they were driving to the mansion. And then she psychically manipulated everything that the bastard was seeing from then on. Casey, she managed to get away, and she fleed with her fellow super crooks, and they all celebrated her psychic mastery, only allowing the bastard to see what she wanted him to see. In the aftermath of the heist, the super crooks all split the $800 million loot eight ways. And we see now how they have enjoyed their money. TK McCabe, he took a European family vacation. Forecast bought a space shuttle. The Ghost apparently bought up most of Greece. Roddy Diesel, he wasn't lying earlier. He actually had a degree in temporal physics from Princeton University. And he took his cut of the loot and began working on creating that time machine that he was pitching the bastard on earlier. Sammy Diesel, though, he basically just spent his money on hookers and did a lot of drugs. The Gladiator, he didn't take a cut of the money. Nonetheless, though, he decided to come out as gay to the world. And to his surprise, he was accepted by society. And it turns out half of his teammates were gay anyway, and they were happy for him. Johnny and Casey, they pooled together a retirement fund, and Johnny proposed to Casey once again. And we assumed that they lived happily ever after. What about Carmine the Heat, though? He owed the Salamander Casino boss $100 million, right? Well, it turns out that the costumes Johnny Bolt made the rest of the super crooks wear on their heist was not their usual costumes. They were wearing different costumes. Costumes identical to those worn by the Salamander Casino boss and his supervillain crew. So the bastard, when he saw some security footage and whatnot, he assumed that the Salamander and his crew was responsible for the robbery on his mansion. So the bastard got his revenge and killed the Salamander and the Salamander's entire crew in a fit of misplaced vengeance. The bastard assumed he got his revenge. So he would leave Johnny and the rest of these super crooks alone. By the bastard killing the salamander, it even removed Carmine's obligation to repay the salamander. And Carmine could keep all of his share of the money from the heist. The book ends with Carmine spending his share of the loot on his favorite things. Fine wine, woman, and most of all, gambling. And that is the end of the super crooks. A happy ending for them all. All right, so that was Super Crooks, and I thought this was a very fun time. Seeing all these eccentric villain characters come together and pull off this Ocean's Eleven style heist on this bastard character and the twists and turns that come with that and how they get away with it in the end was great. It's not a super deep book, but it is popcorn and entertainment. And it was very fun, and the artwork was nice as well. I'm going to give this book a 7.5 out of 10. Pretty good time. And I'm excited for this Netflix anime TV series, as well as whatever this live action project is going to be, and see how it all ties into Jupiter's legacy. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how that all goes down. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back next week covering the Mark Miller book, American Jesus. And we can see how that is like.